Welcome back. Our guest is John Thompson Jr. He was the coach of the men's basketball team at Georgetown University from 1972 to 1979, where he remains coach emeritus. He was also the host of the John Thompson radio show from 1998 until this year here in Washington, D.C. You played your college ball at Providence, but I was also intrigued by the story of who took you in when you lived there. Who are Harold and Marty Furesh? Furesh. 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 Yeah. Well, it was a family in Boston, and, and, and really, they took me in more so when I was with the Celtics. But mm. they would come down and watch the games when I was at uh Providence College, and I spent an awful lot of time and learned a lot of family. They're a Jewish family that was in Westwood, Massachusetts, and um, they treated me as if I were their son, you know what I mean, and, and really exposed me to a lot of things that I had not been exposed to, and I was away from home at the time, and uh, I enjoyed most of all in the evenings just sitting and talking with them and debating with them and particularly Marty Furash. But I I had a great deal of time and, and, and it's like everything else, Kojo. A lot of people contribute to your education and exposing you to things. I, I tell people I went to college to play basketball. I didn't go to college to get an education. I went to play basketball. But after meeting people and being exposed to people, the value of being there for something else other than playing basketball connected itself to you. You know, certainly my mother and my father told me the importance of it. But sometimes you listen to things more clearly when others say it than when your parents say it to you. Indeed, listening is one of the things you apparently did very well. You played for two years as a backup to the legendary center Bill, Bill Russell. Russell. But on a philosophical level, you said you learned a lot from him. And a quote, he said, back then, I listened a lot. <laughs> he was yeah. black before it was fashionable to be black. Well, he was. And, and I tell people that, that, first of all, I played, I know how the man felt that played behind Michael Jordan. He didn't get in the game. <laughs> you know, and when you play against guys who are considered to be the best in the world, that's what's going to happen to you. Russell won 11 championships and had only 10 fingers. You know, <laughs> and so I had an opportunity to take advantage of learning and listening. But one of the things about him that I respected, and I said this to him, Kojo, and I don't think he really comprehended what I was saying to him. I said, the thing I respect most about you is not the fact that you won as much as you won, and I respect you for that, or you played as well as you played. I said, but you made me feel safe. Mm. And I think he thought that I was talking about a physical safeness, mm -hmm. which I was never physically afraid when I was living in Boston or when I was living away from home. But psychologically, because mm -hmm. of what he represented, what he stood for, and how he did things, I knew that nobody would fool with me. You said I never heard him give any speeches, but he has very strong feelings that run deep inside, and he does have the courage of his convictions. And that said to me, John Thompson was taking a measure of this man. No, it's no question about that. I mean, I wasn't playing. What else could I do? <laughs> you know, you really no, I, I did because I respected him. And, and I noticed how he generated respect from other people, and it just, just didn't relate to his ability to play the game. Bill Russell was the first person, African-American person, that I ever heard refer to himself as black. To call a person black in those days was an insult. It's very close to the N-word at that point in time. But Russell was always extremely proud of calling himself black. He's the first person I ever met that gave his kids African names. <laughs> You know, it, 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 and, and he did not intrude upon what you believed, and he did it with a self-confidence about that's what he represented. And just in watching him as a young person at that time, I said, this guy is kind of different. But he, he, he gave me a certain feeling of psychological security. You see what just happened to Ward. Yeah. In, in Boston. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I don't think that's just indicative of Boston. I think we like to find specific cities and label those cities. And as I said that earlier, could generalize. Anyway. That could have happened anyway. Okay. But in the meantime, Russell was the kind of guy that the spillover from that would not have bothered me because I would have known that not only would he protect himself, mm -hmm. he would allow me to have a certain amount of feeling of being safe psychological. Psychological abuse is sometimes far worse than physical abuse. 
and you can retaliate with physical abuse in exactly. many ways. But psychologically, especially for a young person, it, it, it was damaging, and he made me feel comfortable. And that feeling of being safe, apparently, is what you wanted your players to have when they came, whether it was from St. Anthony's in the early years or other public school systems around the country, to Georgetown University. You wanted to make sure that they have not only felt safe, but that they also felt that they were there appropriately. You said, and I remember this, oh, when there was the debate over Proposition 42, 42, 42. Mm -hmm. that it was not how good you were academically when you came in, but when you left. And so you took steps to make sure that your players had the kind of guidance and counseling that would allow them to graduate in what everybody knows is a fairly stringent academic environment. I couldn't help thinking about that when just a week ago, a young man wrote an op-ed piece in the Washington Post saying that he had gone from D.C. public schools and D.C. charter schools to Georgetown and that the D.C. public schools were not preparing young people properly for the campus at Georgetown University. He nevertheless made it through his freshman year and looks prepared, he looks fairly well set to make it through school. But I just wanted to hear your own philosophy about that, about young people coming from inner city schools into an environment like Georgetown and what it took to have them graduate. Well, first of all, and I've said this an awful lot and probably said it too much, I couldn't read in the sixth grade. I, I, I was not able to read. Had there not been for reading clinics that they started, Samantha Wallace Jackson, Dr. Harry Lewis, Sister Eunice, and people who took a chance on me and pushed me, the Furashes who you cited, people who sat down. A lot of kids in this town, even today, are not educated properly, not through their own desire, not through their own doing that they have not been exposed to, they have not been assisted. See, my philosophy was this. I'm going to fight with the world to give you a chance. But if you don't take advantage of that chance, I'm going to get you the hell out of here. <laughs> the people that gave you the chance don't have to worry. I'm not going to put that burden on them. But if this university takes a chance and gives you an opportunity, there are enough professors, there are enough people to give you support. But the bad thing about it is that once you start to do that, People thought that everybody that I tried to get into Georgetown was somebody who needed help, needed special help. That was not the case. You know as well as I knew, most institutions make exceptions for a lot of people in various categories. I tried to give some kids an opportunity who I thought also could contribute athletically to the university. I wasn't just St. Francis of Assisi's running out here grabbing people that couldn't play ball. That was my specialty. That was something that I could use to influence while I won ball games, but I could also influence people in trying to get an education. But there were people who helped me, Kojo. Mm -hmm. And I know that I would not have been in a position as a teacher, I would not have been in a position that I was in had someone not given me an opportunity. And that's what you're talking about, about the young man here in the district. Mm -hmm. Sure, he can talk about the educational system in a district all you want to, but you still have to survive. Uh -huh. You know, you can't go back. It's no reruns. <laughs> you know, you've got to understand that if you were lucky enough, you were one of the few that came out of that system that's lucky enough to get into a Georgetown. Mm -hmm. Well, if you got there, make sure that your damn site took advantage of it. <laughs> And don't worry too much about what it was until you get out of it and then try to politically or economically or whatever way you can change the system. On to the telephones, because there are a lot of people who want to talk to you. Let's start with Tubby in Washington, D.C. Tubby, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Good morning. John, Toby, how you doing? I'm do Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. And I just want to tell you how much respect we have for John Thompson as a college basketball coach. He's been a role model to so many coaches, not just African-American, but many coaches. And I just want to thank you, John. On my way down the country, passing through St. Mary's, heading to St. Mary's County, but uh, I just want to let you know. Tubby, tell you. our listeners what your last name is. Smith, Tubby Smith. <laughs> this is Tubby Smith. Coach Tubby Smith. Uh oh, watch out. Tubby's been trying to get me for years. <laughs> <laughs> Tubby, no, Tubby, Tubby's trying to be like you, Coach Thompson. <laughs> Tubby, 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 ladies and gentlemen, is one of the finest coaches in America. He won a national championship. Kentucky. And he's an educator. He's an educator himself. And 
he's been trying to get me to sell him a little piece of property that I have down in Solomon's Island, but I won't give it to him. <laughs> is this an, is this phone call another attempt to cajole him into selling you that property? It is cajole. I'm, I'm trying to let people know how great a person he is. <laughs> so, so when we start to negotiate, it'll be a lot easier. You know what you yeah. you know what you call that, Tubby? <laughs> Fattening oh, yeah. frogs for snakes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the frog and you the snake. <laughs> nice hearing from you. W, thank you very much for your call. Thank you. It's so good to be here and you speak, Coach Thompson, and talk about what, you know, living in this area and what it meant to you to go to a Catholic school and what it meant to you to, to get an education. He's done a fantastic job. And I just want everyone that I can best, with him the listening voice, to know the importance of John Thompson's life has meant to so many coaches around this country. Thank you. And around the world. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much. We kind of knew that, Tubby. That's why we wanted to bring him back home in this broadcast so that people who are new to Washington could understand just how rooted John Thompson Jr. is in Washington, D.C. And I guess maybe Father John Mudd on the phone may want to talk about that. Father John Mudd, thank you for calling. You're on the air. Go ahead, please. Father Mudd was a student at John Carroll High School when I was there. Whoa, Father Mudd, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Great show, Coach. I was just going to say that I was a year behind John at Carroll High School, and I can tell you that I and my classmates, uh, we uh, revered John, and we revered that team. Uh, those days, uh, we had a tremendous respect for John, and all, I followed his career at Providence, at Boston, back at St. Anthony's in Washington, at, at Georgetown, and his radio, I listened to his radio, listened to his radio show often. John, I have the greatest admiration for you. I have uh, always respected you. I think you're a great man. You've done so much good for this city, so much good for the young people in our city. And I just wanted to say that. Great, great admiration and great respect. And I know I speak for many people, too, John, not just myself when I say that. Thank you, Father. But do me a favor, will you? Send that message up to God, because he knows the bad things I've done in life. <laughs> yeah, I can't do that. I can't forgive sin over the phone. you got to come in in person for that one. I hear you, Father. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you very much for your call. It's my understanding that one of the students who tutored your players in the early days at Georgetown was a young man who did a pretty decent job of climbing the career ladder at Georgetown later in life. Jack DeJoy, who's been a guest on this show, eventually became president of the school. Well, he's he's special in my life. Jack DeJoy is now presently the president of Georgetown University, and it's the damnedest thing in the world, Kojo. You try to tell kids, be careful how you deal with people. <laughs> Because you never know who you're dealing with. You can be a boss later in now, life. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Jack DeJoya was a football player and a track guy at Georgetown. And he and I, I hung around school late at night because I was worried about getting the program going. And we got involved in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes together. And it came down to a point that wouldn't anybody show up but he and I. We'd be <laughs> in the locker room doing what people from the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, I don't want to sound too religious because that's not me, I but know. we were praying. Okay. And this guy grows up that I hung out with, just a student, and becomes the president of the university and is presently now my, my, my boss. But, you know, he, he's a special person anyway because he did a lot of work in South Africa. He's done a lot of work and been conscientious about deprived people. And I, I know that he worked with Mr. Mandela and he worked with a lot of people. But I can't say enough about President DeJoya, but he was just a kid. He was a kid. I could have very easily said, get the heck away from me. I don't have time for you. But luckily... And I'm saying luckily, not spiritually. <laughs> L luckily, I befriended a guy who turns out now to be my boss at Georgetown University. He's the president of the college. Thank you very much for your call, Father John Mudd. We move on now to Carla in Silver Spring, Maryland. Carla, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi, Coach Joe. I met you at the thing in Oxon Hill that you were the moderator for. I moderated a thing in Oxon Hill? For um, her the book about... Harriet Locks. Oh, sure, of course. Yeah. That was with the Creative Dialogues at the oh. University with the University of Maryland Clary Smith Center. Yes, go yeah. ahead, please. I my concern is that student athletes, particularly in football and basketball, don't all graduate, and that they can't get summer jobs because a lot of schools, like the University of Michigan, where my daughter goes, they have to play their sports all year round and condition all year round and they should be doing something to make money like other kids do 
and have other life experiences. What um, do you think, Mr. Thompson? Allow me to have John Thompson respond. I guess one of his most famous players, Patrick Ewing, worked as a page in the Congress during the time when he was playing at Georgetown. Well, he, he did. And, and, you know, I, I understand what she's saying, but I, I, I don't believe that all students do any more or any less than other athletes do. You know what I mean? I don't see a bunch of students that I know who are non-athletic running around trying to get jobs and trying to work and support themselves. I see a lot of them talking on cell phones and tweeting and doing those other things that we see doing. But I understand where you're coming from, but a lot of the young people that you're talking about see athletics as hope and as an opportunity to get out of the situations that they're in. And as I indicated, I didn't go to college for an education. I went to college to play ball, but when I encountered people at the college who told me the value of also what I was there, certainly my mother tried to influence me, my sisters tried to influence me, but I was a knucklehead that didn't pay much attention to that because I thought I was going to be a pro. But until you are in these environments, education doesn't stop in college. See, education doesn't start in college. That if they're exposed to that environment, a lot of the kids who are participating in sports tend to become educated, Kojo, even after they leave college. Certainly a lot of them don't, but people tend to think that this only pertains to athletes. You know, you, you know what gets me, Kojo? I'm going to tell you. He's getting started now. The, 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 yeah, you, you know, folks start talking about the dropout rate in, in high school. There are more kids that drop out that are in school than leave school. Mm -hmm. And we statistically count dropouts only as those people who leave the building. Mm -hmm. But we have a hell of a lot of kids who stay in the building. And have dropped out anyway. And have dropped out anyway. So don't just put that label on athletes. But I understand what she's saying, and I think that she's not totally wrong. Well, whether students are making great or not, how do you feel about the status quo when it comes to them not making any of the money that the NCAA makes off of basketball? That's been a big discussion lately, the NCAA making so much money off of basketball, especially in the tournament, and a lot of kids who are in dire circumstances and could use a few dollars here and there not getting any money. Where do you come down on that? Issue? Well, I don't think a lot of them deserve to make money. <laughs> Let me get that very clear. Yeah, and make that very clear. I, I think that the whole system has to be redefined, Kojo, that we operate now in a very primitive. I had an opportunity to talk with the president of the NCAA. He sat down and spoke with me a couple of weeks ago when I was at the convention. And one of the things that I indicated is that I think that we are operating in an antiquated system. But I don't want to hear anybody say that an education is nothing. To the lady's point that just called, and she's absolutely correct to some extent, that I never heard anybody tell somebody who was non-athletic that there was no value in getting an education. You can get room, board, books, and tuition, but you also can get an education if you apply yourself. But what scares me a lot of times is that it is portrayed, and particularly to African-American kids, that you get nothing. You get an education. First of all, let's start with that. How about the one and out kids, the kids who increasingly are only going to college for one year in order to meet the, the regulations of the NBA and who really don't plan on getting an education? Well, I go back to what I said to you originally. That's, it's, it's one and out of an institution. When you leave higher educational institutions, you don't stop getting an education if you really want to get an education. I don't like one and out. I don't, for the reasons I told you earlier, because a lot of the kids who are doing the ones have not been exposed to people who really made them aware of the value of getting the education. See, the value, the value economically of the NBA, Kojo, is not how you go in it. It's how you come out of it. Correct. And people define it as, oh, he's, he's got millions of dollars. I understand why he's leaving school. Well, how much does he have when he leaves? How much does he have five years after he's out? That's what you need the education for. That's how you need to prepare yourself. Because I don't think, I think it's Pyrex or fool's go in telling kids that you need to leave and stop getting an education because you're going to get all this money. You're going to lose it, too, because that guy that stayed in school is going to take it from you. 
we got to take a short break. We're talking with John Thompson, legendary basketball, men's basketball coach at Georgetown University from 1972 to 1999, where he remains coach emeritus. We're going to take a short break. If you have calls, stay on the line. We'll try to get to as many calls as possible. When we come back, if the lines are busy, send us an email to kojo at wamu.org. I'm Kojo Namdi. <laughs> 